Mr. David Some, Professor Some, as I said earlier, is the CEO for Commission on uh, University Education in Kenya, and is also here uh, presenting the speech of the cabinet secretary. Then you can link up to his presentation. Welcome, sir. The Pro Vice Chancellor for International Development at Coventry University, our High Commissioner, distinguished academics in the House, student fraternity, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. He is delighted and honored to join you today so that he can deliberate on education reforms in Kenya since independence and the opportunity that it has for youth in the diaspora in Kenya. He thanks the organizers for this event and also availing the opportunity to network with the stakeholders. I wish to thank the institutions that have offered us scholarships such as the Commonwealth, Kiel University, who have awarded uh, 10 scholarships to Kenyans recently. We were there yesterday. As a country, we really appreciate the gesture. When independence was imminent in most African countries, two conferences on the development of education in Africa were held. One was held in Addis Ababa in 1961, another one in Tanana Reef in Madagascar in 1962. In these conferences, representatives from all over Africa set educational priorities that aimed at promoting economic and social development. In line with the aforementioned initiatives, the government of Kenya committed itself to eliminate poverty, disease, and illiteracy in 1963. This served as a major impetus for our educational development. The educational programs at that point aimed at achieving more educational opportunities for the Africans which were uh, on a cheaper or a freer uh, Africanization of syllabus and the teaching staff, creating an, an atmosphere in which the African personality and culture could flourish by inculcating values that could enrich people's lives and maintain cohesive sensibilities. The education sector reform in Kenya dates back to the independence period with commissions, committees, working parties, and task forces generating reports with recommendations, some of which have been implemented while others never, uh, never been implemented completely. In 1964, there was the Ominte Commission. In 1976, the National Committee on Educational Objectives and Policies led by Bida Gajadi. In 1981, the Presidential Working Party on Second University, led by Collins Mackay from Canada. In 1988, was the Presidential Working Party on Education and Pan Power Training to the Next Decade and Beyond, led by James Kamunge. In 1999, there was the Commission of Inquiry into the Education System of Kenya, led by Dr. David Koech. In 2003, was the National Conference on Education and Training whose recommendations led to the development of the sessional paper number one of 05. But most recently, 0809, there was the Kamunge II led education task force on the harmonization of legal frameworks on education training and research. Following the promulgation of the Constitution of Kenya 2010, the need to realign the existing legal and policy frameworks arose. Consequently, two task forces were appointed to undertake this task. One was chaired by Professor Douglas Oviambo and was tasked to realign basic education to the Constitution. The second task force for higher education uh, subsector, uh, chaired by myself, uh, Professor Somi, on the realignment of university education, technical and vocational education and training, science, technology, and innovation sector, alignment to Constitution. These two task forces produced the now famous sessional paper number 14 of 2012 on transforming education and training in Kenya and the developments of the various acts of parliament that have governed these sections. 
The reforms in the Kenya education system are based on the following models, approaches, and strategies. The first one is the social demand model. This is concerned with the consumption function of education rather than the investment. In this reform model, education is viewed as a service that is demanded by the public like other services and goods. Therefore, education should be provided for those who want it. The level of social demand of education is a good indicator of the desire by the population in a country to reform and develop education to meet this demand. The second is manpower requirements, which entails the analysis of the market needs of a country in human resources. Stakeholders examine resources needed in a country available in the past, in the present, and in the future. The model considers the development of human resources through educational system as an important requirement for economic growth. Therefore, any nation with reforms on, for economic development has to consider the preparation of its human resource. The third is the return on education versus the cost-benefit analysis approach. The cost-benefit analysis is a systemic comparison of the costs and benefits of some form of investment in order to assess its profitability. The approach focuses on the economic benefits of education. This focuses on human capital as an investment in human beings and after acquiring the necessary skills, yield benefits over the larger society. A human skill is the same as a physical capital. Therefore, human capital development is as important as physical capital. Thank you. Thank you. Increase in education investment derives benefits and costs of education in the society. The beneficiaries include the society, the government, the individual, among others. Here, the government incurs costs and enjoys benefits in education. Lastly, private sector, private firms, private companies employ the skills and enjoy skills from education. The concept of profitability depends on systematic comparison between benefits derived from expenditure in card earlier in education. Stakeholders in reforms examine various levels of education, primary, secondary, third year levels, or general education versus vocational and technical education. This involves an analysis of the cost incurred in their developments and the benefits accrued from them. A decision is then made where money is supposed to be invested. Ladies and gentlemen, it's worth noting that reforms have been carried out in the education, science, and technology sector over the years. However, I seek your indulgence to allow me to concentrate on the reforms in higher education, and in particular, university education. Three legislations were recently enacted in the last two years in higher education, science, and technology sector, namely the Universities Act 2012, the Technical and Vocational Education and Training Act 2013, and the Science, Technology, and Innovations Act 2013. In a nutshell, TVET, Technical and Vocational Education and Training Act, provides for the promotion of access and equity to quality and relevant TVET training. Key reforms resulting from this legislation is the creation of Technical and Vocational Education and Training Authority, we refer to it as TIVETA, that will manage uh, and be responsible for regulation and coordination of training in this country. Creation of a Certification Council, we call it the TIVET Curriculum Development Assessment and Certification Council, and the creation of the TIVET Funding Board. It has also expanded the mandate of the Higher Education Loans Board, and I know that uh, Charles will say this later, to provide loans for students who are taking technical and vocational education and training. Science, Technology, and Innovations Act, on the other hand, 
kite science, technology, and innovation sector. It has provided the following reforms. One, the establishment of the National Commission of Science, Technology, and Innovations. We abbreviate this to NACOSTI. And if you remember, this is the successor to the National Council of Science and Technology. The objective of NACOSTI is to regulate and assure quality in science, technology, and innovations. The Science, Technology, and Innovations Act also created the establishment of an organ we call Kenya National Innovations Agency. The abbreviation is Kenya, K-E-N-I-A, that shall develop and manage the Kenya National Innovation System. Lastly, the creation of the National Research Fund. And we were really fortunate because when this went to parliament and with the Abuja Convention that said African countries should sign into law the provision of a national research fund. Our parliament signed into law the provision of 2% of GDP. If that was translated to this year's budget, that would make a provision of 70 billion Kenya shillings to research. And so since the act came in after the budget had gone, we look forward to July this year when there will be provisions of this fund. Just as a comparison, the total expenditure on the research in the country for this year was just under 12 billion. So the provision of about 70 billion will greatly improve this uh, area. It is evident that since independence 1963, the provision of higher education in Kenya, as in other African countries, has been subject to dynamic, dynamics of fast changing society. The government has had to demonstrate some commitment to the development of higher education because of the latter significance in the production of skilled manpower, including manpower for other levels of education. Society, for its part, has demonstrated a great appetite for university education. In this regard, the greatest challenge is to provide high quality education that is also relevant and accessible. This primary challenge has compounded by the fact that in the 80s, Kenya has had experience of financial difficulty due to poor economic performance, rapid population growth, and the pattern of providing basic services such as the primary education and the healthcare, which has meant that university education has faced severe competition for limited government funding. Systemic, institutional, economic, social, political factors have therefore conspired to force the universities to reform. The university education reform has centered on the following key thematic areas. And let me not go through in detail because I'll demonstrate in my own presentation. The first one is the legal and regulatory framework. This is contained in the Education Act 2012. The governance and management. Again, this is demonstrated um, in the Act, but just to mention, as you all remember, before 2003, before President Kibaki came in, we had only one chancellor for all the universities. The president was one chancellor. In 2003, President Kibaki appointed, um, I call them citizen chancellors, uh, to, re to be a, university, a chancellor for each university. These are some of the challenges and changes that have occurred in the university sector. Um, with regard to university councils, which are the governing organs, uh, their membership has been reviewed, their numbers rationalized, and actually the ensuing representation of gender and regional balance has more than made a relevant composition of, an, of a governing body. Um, following the initiatives of economic recovery for poverty eradication and wealth creation, most of you may remember this, it is mandatory for all ministry, departments, state corporations to embrace performance contracting. The universities are no exemption to this, and we are seeing key performance targets, amounts of research grants that they have attracted, collaboration with other in institutions, linkages with industry, the number of graduates in science, technology, innovation, among others, increasing because of the performance contracting. And because of this also, 
a number of universities now in Kenya, if not all of them, have embraced ISO certification in order to have, uh, enhance efficiency and effectiveness in service delivery. In order to enhance efficiency and effectiveness in placement of qualified students completing secondary schools into university and colleges, the Kenya Universities and Colleges Central Placement Services, it's referred to as placement service similar to SECA in the UK, it's been established. The minister is actually inaugurating this service on Monday the 10th, the day after tomorrow in Nairobi. This service will provide also career guidance and counseling service to assist students make informed career choices over the decisions. The other challenge has been access and equity. Government's commitment to ensure access to education by all Kenyans can be traced back to 1963. To ensure that the expansion also takes account of economically disadvantaged and marginalized groups, a affirmative action programs were established the current practice of permitting the admission to the public universities of female students, students from assault regions, arid and semi-arid regions, and special needs students with slightly lower grades than their more favored counterparts is being practiced and will continue to be practiced by the placement service. Establishment and strengthening of the Higher Education Loans Board, uh, the bursary and scholarships program, has benefited to a large extent the body of needy students. The other challenge is quality and relevance, but I will talk a little about that in my own presentation, so let me skip on that. But let me talk about financing of university education. At independence, the government was fully financing education at all levels. Our ambassador said he went to Makerere, as among the first students who went to Nairobi as a degree myself, let me not say when, but uh, I've been teaching for 32 years in the university, so it gives you a good idea. Um, we were paid to go to school. We actually used to get money called boom. And boom was very bad money. Every time we put boom in the pocket, I tell you a secret, every time we put boom in the pocket, we couldn't study. Boom money was really bad. You had to go out and finish the money so that you can come to class. At independence, as I said, the government was fully financing education at all levels, but due to slow economic growth and increased competition for limited resources, the government has over time been constrained. Consequently, in 1988, it introduced the cost sharing where the students are directly expected to meet part of the cost of education. More so, universities are expected to diversify their sources so as to enhance their levels of income. This is expected to supplement what the government provides. Universities are encouraged to intensify their income generating activities by expanding programs for fee paying students while paying attention to the implications for education quality and equity. Securing the support of private sector through student and staff internship programs, research support, student sponsorships, teaching support, introduction of private sector training levy, involving alumni in fundraising programs, reaching out to individual benefactors of university education, and generally utilizing all resources at their disposal for more efficient and effective provision of service. The key achievements in university education as a result of these reforms include enhanced corporate governance and management in universities resulting from the new governance structures, this has enhanced transparency, accountability, efficiency, and effectiveness. More so, the confidence of our investors and clients. Access and equity, we boost of an access, enhanced access, whereby currently we have 465,000 registered students enrolled in our university education. The number of the public universities has increased, as you know, from one in 1971, the University of Nairobi, to currently 22 public, fully chartered universities, plus nine university colleges. Uh, beside this, we have 36 private universities, making a total of 67 universities in all. Um, so coming from one in 1971 to 67 now, 
you can see the achievement in this area. The establishment, of course, of the Commission for University Education to assure or to oversee the quality assurance is coming to force. Improved performance of Kenya universities in the global ranking. I was very pleased to note, as the Pro Vice Chancellor was saying, uh, Coventry University is ranked among the top uh, in attracting international students and offering the engineering. When I was downstairs, I, I couldn't resist the temptation of, on jumping on the area chat. Any engineer would not. Um, which, which university can say we have an area chat? Coventry. Uh, university of Nairobi has come from over 3,000 positions to currently this year 1,624 globally. Believe me, that's a really big jump. Uh, it's been position 12 in Africa, uh, coming down from 15. Others that we saw this year jumping to very high positions in Africa, very low positions in Africa, include Maseno University, which was really amazing. It jumped 100 positions to being the second university in the country. Moore University, Edgerton University, uh, Chomo Kenyatta University, Strathmore University. Strathmore is the highest of the private universities in the ranking. We've also improved on the gender parity in university education. Currently, it stands at 57% male and 43% female. This is an improvement from the ratio of 71% and 29% in 1990. So that's an achievement. What are the opportunities for Kenyan youth in diaspora in Kenya? I think the first is the employment opportunities. The Constitution of Kenya 2010 provides for a devolved system of government. This is currently being operationalized by the Jubilee government. This avails employment opportunities for people with technical know-how and exposure, like yourselves. The university education sector has expanded rapidly, and we are short of competent human resource, particularly those with masters and PhDs in technical areas. Such individuals are urgently required to teach and to also carry out consultancies and research for the government flagship projects that we have mentioned as provided for in Vision 2030. Work for multinational companies, industries that exploit newly discovered mineral resources such as the petroleum in Turkana area, the rare earth metals in Taita Taveta, uh, titanium for example, the coal that we've discovered in the Moa plain in, in, the, in Kitui, and other and others to continue to discover within our countries and our neighbors. Provide the skills needed to undertake and maintain numerous infrastructure. I think His uh, Excellency Ambassador mentioned the Lapset project, the Lamu Chupa project, and um, a few other projects that are envisaged as seen in the Vision 2030. We also have the opportunity for diaspora for investment opportunities. The government has officially enacted a Public-Private Partnerships Act that guides, that provides an opportunity for you to partner with government in providing services and goods. It is therefore an important area of potential engagement where you can invest. In our universities, we are looking for individuals or organizations who can partner with our institutions to provide infrastructure in terms of construction of workshops, laboratories, equipment, hostels, um, tuition facilities, and other researchable uh, areas. I wish to challenge you to use your knowledge, skills, and technology acquired here in assisting local industries and agriculture to intensify value addition of our products in order to increase the exportation of finished products to foreign markets, which fetch better returns. In this regard, we have in mind products like coffee, tea, milk, horticulture, flowers, fruits, etc. The third opportunity is business opportunities. Again, the Constitution provides empowerment of youth and women 
The Jubilee government recognized the youth and women as the key catalyst for our economy, uh, economic, social, and political agenda. Therefore, they have in particular made provisions of 30% of government procurement for the youth. Now, this is law. I can tell you. I practice it. 30% of my procurement must go to youth and women. I hereby challenge you to seize this opportunity since youth by definition is anybody under 30 if you are male, eh? but if you are female, you have it throughout your life. <coughs> More so, the government has set, aside, has set aside a substantial amount for the next three years, 6 billion shillings in terms of youth enterprise fund to be used as a startup capital for youth enterprises. Kindly utilize these funds to position yourselves in the market in Kenya. The fourth opportunity is collaboration partnership with universities. Throughout, through research, you as scholars can collaborate or partner with staff or fellow students to carry out studies that would result in innovation that can address the problem facing mankind at this moment of improvement on the livelihoods of our people. When um, Professor Alex was talking, I, I have personally met the youth who innovated M-Pesa. There are two interesting characteristics about him. The first one, he is not a graduate. He did a diploma at Kenya Polytechnic. Uh, and when, I, when we met him, I was then chairman of the National Council, he was not earning anything from m -Pesa. So we argued with Safaricom, this is an innovation. You actually acknowledge this young man made this innovation. What would you give? After a long, lengthy discussion, they gave him 0.2% of the royalties of m -Pesa. So we were so disappointed. Until they said, do you know how much that is? That is 12.5 million monthly. <laughs> In Kenya shillings, eh? not pounds. And then we were so happy. So innovations can, innovations can pay. <laughs> At the time we were negotiating, it was 12.5 million per month. Right now, with the M-Pesa increasing by about three times, that would easily be around 30 million a month. So innovations pay. But let me tell you two other innovations that I saw. Again at Safaricom, there was this cleaning lady, and she was always running out of airtime. So she used to tell people, could you give me 50 bob airtime? When I get to fill my card, I'll give you 55 bob. Safaricom said, that sounds like a good innovation. Why don't we give it to everybody? So they called it Okoa Jahazi. For every 50 bob you get, you borrow, you pay back 55 bob when you next load up your phone. Guess what? In three months, it had given out those Okoa Jahazis, which is credit, which is a loan, and it exceeded all the loans in Kenya. Believe it or not. So the earnings from five bob in every 50 bob and you know sometimes you go or go a for five minutes or for one day. What does it matter? You're going to pay an interest of five bob in 50. If you work that out over the year, that is one of the revenue earnings Safaricom is making. Big. Thankfully, that lady is given airtime for her life. And also some credit, because it's an innovation. Okay. And, and there are so many other innovations that we can think about. In conclusion, we call upon all our partners to increase the support in terms of providing new scholarships as well as enhancing old ones. We call upon universities present to seek collaborations with Kenyan institutions and institutions of higher learning to encourage cultural staff student exchanges, joint researches, capacity building among others. We urge investors and well-wishers to invest in the numerous opportunities available in the education sector, in the establishment of institutions, 
collaborations and local institutions. Kenya has a vibrant private sector university education, which still has a lot of room for investment. Demand for higher education is still high, despite the limited absorptions. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all, and may God bless you.